Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. Welcome to today's luncheon event at the Rumi Forum in Washington, D.C. I'm Tarek Shafi. Our guest speaker today is Ambassador James F. Collins and the title of his talk is Why Russia Matters, U.S.-Russian Relations in the Obama Administration. Ambassador Collins has an impressive resume indeed. He was appointed the director of the Russia and Eurasia program in January 2007 at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He was the U.S. Ambassador to the Russian Federation from 97 to 2001. Prior to joining the Carnegie, he served as Senior Advisor with Aiken and Gump. He has also served as Ambassador at Large and Special Advisor to the Secretary of State for the new independent states and as Deputy Chief of Mission and Charge of Affairs at the American Embassy in Moscow. He has also held positions in the American Embassy in Amman, Jordan, and the Consulate General in Izmir, Turkey. His awards and achievements are numerous. He is the recipient of the Secretary of State's Award for Distinguished Service, the Department of State's Distinguished Honor Award, the Secretary of State's Award for Career Achievement, the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service, and the NASA Medal for Distinguished Service. Ambassador Collins has been active on the boards of non-profit organizations concerned with U.S. foreign policy and U.S. relations with Russia, East Europe, and Eurasia. He has served as a member of the board of the U.S.-Russia Business Council, the American Academy of Diplomacy, the Open World Leadership Center, and American Councils for International Education. He is also a member of the advisory board of the Civilian Research and Development Foundation and the Library of Foreign Literature in Moscow. Before joining the State Department, Ambassador Collins taught Russian and European history, American government, and economics at the U.S. Nav Naval Academy. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to the Rumi Forum. It's great to be with you, Tariq. I guess I should start by asking you first about a question that is inherent in the title of your talk. Why indeed is Russia, why does it matter, and does it matter more now than it did during the previous administration? Well, I'm not sure it matters more than in the previous administration, but the way it matters in many ways has been quite constant over many decades now. Um, I think uh, not to be too lengthy. Uh, one can see that Russia, first of all, is a very big country and it occupies a particularly important piece of geography. Uh, it is 11 time zones wide. Uh, it borders Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, Europe, all areas which are critically important to the United States in various ways that differ but nevertheless are important. And one reason therefore that Russia is important and remains important is we run up against or find Russia in all of those territories. So we deal with Russia on a daily basis on a broad range of issues. Second issue uh, that's uh, left over in some ways from the Cold War but is very real and is also looking to the future is that Russia is the other nuclear superpower. Uh, together, the two of us can possess somewhere between 90 and 95 uh, percent of the nuclear weapons in the world. Uh, it is simply a fact that uh, if we do not manage that well, find the answer to reducing nuclear weapons, and as um, President Obama has tried to suggest, uh, a way to reduce them ultimately to zero, um, such a program will simply not exist internationally. Uh, the two of us are going to have to agree on goals and basic framework if we are to do that. And the second dimension of that is the, the future of nuclear energy, nuclear power, the problems of proliferation of nuclear technologies. Uh, once again, if we and the Russians are not able to come to terms, in essence, on how we will shape a future to prevent proliferation at a time when nuclear power is going to expand, then we're not going to have an international regime. So it's critical to us in, in, I would say, the nuclear and weapons of mass destruction future. And finally, um, if we look at the agenda of the United States today, uh, our foreign policy agenda, 
I think it's probably fair to say that Russia, per se, other than in the nuclear field, doesn't rise to number one on the list very often. But if you take a list of ten, I believe you would find, whether it's climate change, Afghanistan, Middle East, uh, European security, whatever we would make that list, Russia is an active player in each of those areas. And therefore, if we do not have the capacity to work well with Russia, it is very hard for us to advance our goals and our objectives in a much more complex world than it was 25 years ago uh, without being able to work con productively and continuously with, with the people who are in charge in Moscow. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, talking of working together, it seems to me as a layman that uh, when Secretary of State Clinton went just recently to Russia, um, had meetings with her counterpart, Putin was elsewhere. Uh, she, I think, spoke and met with Medvedev, the president. And there were some mixed signals about sanctions, for example, against Iran. One party said they could work, and there was uh, unanimity within Russia among certain circles, but then Putin came about and uh, came around and said uh, they would be counterproductive. Does it matter uh, what they're saying and which person is saying, and does it matter to us which party we should listen to? Well, I long believed that um, it's a great mistake for an outside government to get into the business of trying to play internal politics or bet on internal political developments in any other country. Usually we don't understand it. Uh, lots of people think we do, and of course, you know, we at Carnegie think we do understand all these things. But <laughs> frankly, uh, I have a great degree of humility when it comes to thinking that we understand the inner workings of the Russian government any more than I thought we understood the inner workings of the Jordanian government when I was there. But we do work with the government, and I think we have to assume that uh, in the current environment, if uh, President Obama reaches an agreement with Mr. Medvedev, that is a, an agreement between the two governments. Mm -hmm. It's not just two individuals. I personally do not believe that Mr. Medvedev in these cases makes an agreement on his own without consulting with his prime minister, and I suspect the other way around is true as well. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think one has to look at the recent visit by Secretary Clinton in which the Iran question factored as did the it did as it did in the meeting in July between the two presidents and in London uh, in April before that. Uh, Iran has been with us as a significant element in our relations since the early 90s. And the nuclear dimension of that problem has been I would say paramount in the way we are dealing with the problem or have to deal with the problem for at least the last 15 years. I think there, there are uh, areas of agreement and areas of disagreement between us. And the issue has been how do we manage the where we disagree and, and take advantage of where we agree. We seem to agree with Russia on the one, one essential fact, that it would be a bad thing for Iran to acquire nuclear weapons. Right. Um, I think we also agree that at this point that Iran has the, the right, and indeed is under the, its role as signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, to enjoy the, the rights and privileges of a state to develop peaceful nuclear energy. Uh, the problem is the, the lack of faith in what Iran is really doing, in, uh, certainly in Washington, and I believe equally in Moscow, that there is no great trust in the Iranian government or what it's doing, and therefore a great incentive to believe we have to be satisfied through a variety of means that Iran is going to adhere to its responsibilities under the Non-Proliferation Treaty and not develop a weapons program. The question is, how do you do that? And I think uh, we certainly have believed in one way or another that international sanctions is an effective tool, uh, or at least the threat of them is an effective tool to encourage Iran to move 
toward the responsible position we think is important. The Russians are doubtful in many ways that sanctions work. Um, they, I think, uh, recently, however, if you look at the last few weeks, have been emphasizing uh, the idea that because Iran has showed some willingness to open up new, potentially new options, inspection of this new site, uh, the possible, uh, at least for a limited time, transfer of some of their uh, uranium to, to Russia for enrichment and so on that there are new openings here. And the Russian position, as I understand it, in when Secretary Clinton was there, is we need to work this through and see where it can lead, whether this will get us where we need to go. I'm not, it's not clear to me whether the American side actually asked for anything more. What Secretary Clinton wanted to do, however, was to discuss with Mr. Lavrov, the, the Russian foreign minister, what do we do if they don't? perform under these assurances. And Mr. Lavrov said, well, I don't want to discuss hypotheticals in essence. Um, you know, let's, let's pursue what we have in hand and we'll cross the next bridge when we come to it. Mm. Do I think we agree on Iran? I think we agree on many fundamentals and I think we still have sort of basic disagreements on tactics. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's out there, but I would say we're much better off today than we were couple of years ago on this issue. Right. We're, we're probably much closer in our views than we were before. And if, if we have one more minute, of I'll course. simply give you the, the, the reasoning I think is behind where the Russians are today. The Russians, when I was ambassador and really for some years after that, simply denied that there was any weapons program or that there was anything other than the basic nuclear program the Russians were working with Iran to complete in building this reactor at the site in Bushir. Um, three things happened to change that and to make them much more concerned about what Iran was up to and what, what was really going on. First of all, uh, for most of the 1990s and on into the early part of this decade, the Iranian project was a major source of income for what was called Min Adam, that is the Russian nuclear complex, uh, when, at a time when Russia was basically broke and they didn't have many such sources of income. So it kept the nuclear complex alive in, in substantial part. Money was important. Secondly, uh, that uh, the Russians were convinced that not the Iranian uh, nuclear establishment couldn't be doing anything they wouldn't know about. And I was given assurances many, many times that that was the case. You know, that the idea that anything can be going on we don't have a full command of is just sort of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had some experience with that ourselves, so, you know, I treated that with some skepticism. Um, and thirdly, that Iran had a perfect right to be doing what it was doing. Under this. Well, three things happened to change that. First, there was the revelation about two, three years ago, I don't remember exactly when, that the Iranians were in fact pursuing, pursuing an enrichment program. Mm -hmm. uh, this was revealed when people uh, found the Nantaz plant. Uh, that was a great shock to the Russians. Uh, and those who had assured everybody that everything was known I think uh, found themselves having to answer some very difficult questions from, from their leadership amongst other things. Uh, the second thing that happened was that money became less of an issue for the Russian nuclear establishment and the Iranian role in money became less important as well because the Bushir plant had largely been completed, money was not flowing in the same way so there was less uh, influence, if you will, from Iran because of its financial support. Uh, secondly, the price of oil was going up. Russia was suddenly getting a major income and could support its own nuclear establishment. They were less, much less dependent on, on Iran. So it weakened their, uh, I would say, need to be uh, quite as concerned about how Iran would react. And this was the period in which you began to have arguments about delivery of pieces of the reactor and so forth. 
And the third thing that happened about two years ago was equally profound and I think has, has more or less framed the, the issue at this point. And that is that the Russian uh, Ministry of Atomic Energy, which had not changed since the Soviet period, was uh, reformed and restructured in very profound ways uh, under the directorship of a, uh, a very uh, uh, impressive man, Mr. Kiryenko, to break off the, the weapons regulatory function from the commercial side of the uh, nuclear complex, that is reactor uh, construction and development, fuel cycle management, and so forth, um, because Russia wanted to become, wants to become a major uh, one of the nuclear suppliers for the world. Now to do that uh, successfully, you cannot rely essentially on supplying people who do not follow the rules. And the nuclear suppliers group, so-called, has a fairly, a fairly well-structured set of guidelines and rules that it is supposed to follow if you're going to be in good standing and have access to the broad market for nuclear technology. Iran is a problem mm -hmm. now. It is rather than being a, in some sense, a big benefit, it's a problem. And I think that has shifted the, uh, the thinking in Moscow. Now, it hasn't meant that they simply then buy the American position. I'm not suggesting that. But I am suggesting, though, that the considerations Moscow now brings to thinking about the Iranian nuclear complex is rather different from what it was five, six years ago when this argument was first framed. And I think it's, you know, I, I, I believe that the negotiations we're conducting are finding uh, somewhat greater opportunities because the background is different. Mm -hmm. Israel, the threat of Israel attacking unilaterally Iran and its nuclear weapon sites, <coughs> has that abated because of what's going on recently in the past several weeks? Well, I can certainly tell you that um, one of the unswerving positions of the Russian government has been there should be no military solution to the nuclear issue in Iran and they are dead set against it. I believe uh, we are in the same position these days although we we will s not say that in so many words we continue to say all options are on the table but uh, I, I don't know that I can really say for sure I, I have the impression that there is very strong effort by the American government to assure, ensure that we do not have military action uh, in a situation such as Iran's where number one, nobody knows whether it would work or be effective, and number two, where the implications of it or the outcome of it are, I would submit, uh, almost totally unpredictable. Mm -hmm. What would happen in the Middle East as a whole, uh, how Iran would uh, respond to this. I mean, they certainly wouldn't respond basically by trying to do it in the same way. You would have what people are calling asymmetrical responses of various kinds. It would not be pretty. And it would seem to me uh, it could launch or, or open a bunch of Pandora's boxes, which we here in Washington, in my view, ought to be doing everything possible to prevent. Mm -hmm. When the Obama administration first came into being, there was a talk of resetting the uh, relationship between the U.S. and Russia. Could you tell us what that means, the reset of the relationship? Can you elaborate? Um, uh, I think um, what, uh, what it has meant from the beginning um, starts with a, with a certain premise and it also takes account of how bad relations with Russia had become uh, by the end of the Bush administration in many ways because of the Caucasus War. Um, the war where Russia and Georgia went to war. Um, 
I mean, it's a fact mm -hmm. that relations by the end of the Bush administration had really reached about their lowest point since the end of the Cold War or before. I would even submit perhaps in going back to the Brezhnev era. Um, <coughs> we had pretty much of a dysfunctional relationship. People were not talking to each other. Um, when they did, it was through public statements usually being accusatory of the other. Um, there was a certain amount that went on under the radar uh, and, and was, you know, kept continuing. There were student exchanges and, you know, a certain amount of economic activity. But at a political level, we really were at sort of uh, stalemate. Um, moreover, there had uh, arisen by this time uh, some real worries in Europe about just what Russia had meant in taking the military action it did in response to what now it, I think is agreed is, was a conflict that Georgia uh, rather unwisely started uh, through some pretty rash action. Um, and uh, it was not clear just w how we would get out of this. Now I think that's, that, that was where Obama comes in. The Obama people I think believed that for a variety of reasons that I tried to suggest at the beginning of why Russia is important to us that we had to do something differently if we were going to have a workable relationship with a, with a major power that really was going to be important to a lot of our uh, ability to conduct diplomacy. And so they talked about reset. <laughs> uh, let, let's see what we can do to start over. Now it takes two to reset, first of all. So I think it's clear, you know, that there, uh, despite a lot of op-ed writers and so on, I think there are no illusions on this side that it's a one-sided affair. It has to be a joint effort if it's going to produce anything. But what the Obama administration essentially did, I think, were, was two things. It said uh, at the outset, and this was what Mr. Biden did when he gave his reset speech and then Secretary Clinton met with Lavrov. Um, before the presidents met the first time in London. It was, number one, we are prepared to sort of put anything on the table and talk about it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean we'll agree, and we're not giving up on our principles or our allies or anything else, but we are prepared to discuss any issues that we need to. Um, secondly, we are prepared to work with Russia where we can to find out where we can cooperate or find common ground and see whether we can build a more constructive and productive approach to managing <laughs> our relations and to dealing with some of the issues that are on Russia's mind as well as our own. And so it was in London, I think, set out that uh, we w there were three things that London did. It set a very broad agenda. It more or less said, we have met and we've agreed we'll talk about everything on our, our very broad agenda from regional conflicts like Afghanistan or uh, Caucasus to nuclear issues, et cetera. So uh, all of it's on the table. Um, and we need to do what we can to strengthen our bilateral capacity, so commercial relations and so forth. Second thing it did was to set some priorities. You know, not everything, despite what I used to hear as an ambassador where I'd get cables from Washington where everything was first priority, but <laughs> th that there were some priorities in the relationship. And the first and singular most important one was to find a way to negotiate a new agreement with between Russia and the United States that would prevent the uh, disintegration of the arms control framework that was embodied in the current Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. So we have this negotiation uh, to do what's called a follow-on to start. Uh, the second was proliferation. I would say they were, they were sort of put together. The nuclear complex was what we were talking about. Um, the second was um, uh, that we would uh, look at uh, some, re some of the regional conflicts, and particularly Afghanistan. And the third was that they would uh, establish uh, a commission or a framework within which to conduct our relations over the coming years in a more structured way than had been the case in the previous administration, which frankly never had a structure to, 
to do the business. That was London. It didn't really resolve a lot. It, it did set the priorities and it gave some guidance to the negotiators on the nuclear arms question. Um, and it agreed, uh, they agreed that the presidents would get together in the summer. Um, the summer meeting in July built on that. And I, and I would say, uh, you know, in essence, it carried further the, the work that had been described in London. It gave some rather specific guidance to the negotiators of the arms control agreement. Uh, they talked more about uh, nuclear proliferation. President Obama by that time has given his Prague speech and he's uh, made, made the announcement that he's going to gather people here in Washington in April about uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear material security. Um, they also made a very significant agreement about Afghanistan where Russia agreed that it would permit uh, now the transit of not just non-lethal but also lethal military equipment across Russian territory to support the Afghan operations. Um, they uh, signed another agreement on military to military exchanges which is, is significant in my view. And then they uh, set up this commission that has, I think now it actually has 16 working groups. Among those, however, being the negotiation of the arms control agreement and so on. All of this is really meant to try to see what, can, what we can do. Uh, there's a pretty good feeling that we're going to get a start agreement, a, a, a follow on to this strategic offensive arms agreement. Um, we have the issues remaining are what do we do about missile defense, which has been much easier now that we have changed our approach to it uh, in Europe. Uh, what are we going to do about so-called counting rules? This is pretty arcane stuff, but I mean it, it basically means how many warheads can be on a missile and how many missiles can you have. Uh, and the third issue is is really. Um, how do you deal with verification? Mm -hmm. uh, this, is a, this probably is the most critical part, really, of this agreement, is the ability to keep the verification regimes going. Uh, of some kind, it'll be one. I think we'll get an agreement. Um, and on the nuclear issue, other, other things are going forward. I mean, there are regular discussions now. They've had back and forth between our Secretaries of Energy and Minister of Energy. Uh, I think there is reasonable feeling that that's doing well. Some of the other areas where the Commission is working are going s more slowly, Commerce Department, uh, Trade, and, and so on. But it is, it is there as a structure. And a final word about the Afghan agreement. Um, first of all, uh, most Americans, I think, don't understand the scale of this. I mean, we're, we're talking about up to some 5,000 flights a year. I mean, this is not an occasional flight across. This is a system mm -hmm. of logistics support. Uh, it is going to have to engage the Russian side significantly in order to make it work. Uh, everything from air control to uh, customs officials. I mean, you know, it, it involves lots of people. So you have to have lots of people buying into the idea that they are going to work with us on Afghanistan, I think is the um, I think the dimensions of that agreement are significant in that. This is a new area in which we had not cooperated before. I mean, if you recall, we were rather on the opposite sides of Afghanistan in the right. 70s and 80s. Um, now I think there is a sense that we all have a shared interest in not having the Taliban back mm -hmm. and in, in doing something about narcotics. That's right. Uh, and the Russians certainly give great emphasis to that uh, and to this. So here we have a, a, a new area in which I would say we're feeling our way. Russia is feeling its way not only with us but with NATO. And I, if you add, say it, that the point of this in some ways is to explore where is it we are going to be able to cooperate and how, it seems to me we haven't made a bad beginning. But I would say that this is all rather fragile still. 
Uh, reset is a very nice idea. Uh, it is not done in a day or by one meeting. Um, it is going to be done by a pattern of behavior and, and capacity that will demonstrate itself over time or fail. And I think at the moment there are people who are very much trying to make it work and there are others who are frankly opponents of elements of it or all of it in both countries or find it naive or whatever. So I mean I, I think the, the returns are yet to come in but I am reasonably satisfied that we have number one had no big setbacks and number two that the areas where we have moved do reflect I would say both countries priorities and the ability to work on issues that are of importance to us. And that's something we were not doing a year ago. Mm -hmm. Staying with the nuclear arms issue for a bit, uh, in some circles here in the U.S., uh, some conservative thinkers and analysts <coughs> have said that uh, we have committed, for example, to remove interceptor missiles from Poland, radar stations from the Czech Republic. It seems to them to be a one-way street. Uh, from what you're saying, it isn't. Are the Russians playing us like a fiddle? Well, I, I don't think the U.S. government's officialdom in the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies and other, first of all, they haven't changed. The, the majority of people who deal with this, this kind of issue. Um, I think it's, uh, it's not credible to assume that the United States is incapable of managing the Russian diplomatic account effectively in these areas. We've got a lot of experience with it. Um, you know, there are arguments about different aspects of this. Different people have different views about what American posture should be, how we should arm ourselves, so forth. Um, and there are certainly different views about the basic idea of having a structure to uh, I guess define the framework within which nuclear weapons are going to play a role in future security uh, for this country as well as, as globally. Uh, I personally have never understood the argument that we will be better off with no rules uh, or no treaties. I mean it never made much sense to me. Um, even from a financial point of view as a taxpayer uh, it's, it's easier to understand what, what your threats are than if you don't know or it's a decision of somebody else without reference to you where you'll go. But I, I mean I think the, the essential point I would make is that this is a central issue for uh, nuclear arms are very central to the U.S.-Russia relationship. Uh, the Russian sign uh, supports and wants a framework. They want predictability about what kind of arms they will face or what sort of uh, forces they need to, to respond. They want uh, stability in that. Uh, I think those who support this think we need the same thing uh, in this country. Uh, that is what the framework has, has more or less provided in terms of uh, lowering numbers, limiting numbers. Uh, limiting the ways in which they're structured. Now, the new agreement is not going to be the same as the previous one. It will be different. It will have different uh, rules, I suspect, for who can do what. Uh, there will be some lowering of numbers of warheads. But the real question, in my mind, is whether we will get an effective regime that has worked very well in the first START agreement of what I would only call confidence building that we know what each other are doing. And this is based on the verification measures, the structure of back and forth inspections, uh, in a sense increasing transparency on each side about what the other is doing uh, that uh, gives confidence that we know what we're dealing with. Now, I personally believe very strongly that we're better off having such a treaty, such a framework, because it gives us the same confidence to know and uh, understand what the other side is up to. And it basically gives them the confidence not to, to think that they don't know, mm -hmm. which is dangerous usually. 
A lot of people made a lot of fun of George W. Bush because he once gazed into the eyes of Putin and saw a soulmate. Uh, President Obama is more reticent. I guess he's learned from there. But being a young, fairly inexperienced commander in chief, do you think the Russians know this? But and also, at a certain level, personal relationships do matter, don't they? Uh, strategic interests do matter. Agreements matter. But at a certain point, is it essential that Medvedev and Obama and Putin and Lavrov and Clinton, they get along with each other? Um, I would never say that it is not important to have the ability between leaders or among leaders to talk with one another candidly and to have a degree of trust and confidence in, in the relationship. Uh, you know, some people like each other, don't like each other, but if this issue of respect, confidence, and, and the fact that you're dealing with someone who can, can deliver on a promise and keep it, if you don't have that, you have a problem. And that is, a, is partly a human function. But I also would say that um, I, I share a lot of the, uh, the doubts about the degree to which just having that or relying on that to produce major events of significance or change or uh, agreements of significance is always very risky. Um, Mr. Medvedev and Mr. Putin are not Joe Stalin. I mean, they have politics as well. They have constituencies at home. They have to be able to bring their people along, just as our president has to do the same with Congress and the constituents. But to a lesser so, level, well, it may, we, we, well, perhaps it is to a lesser level, but it's not an insignificant level. And I think the, the point here is that when you think you can have everything resolved simply by get, having a good relationship between uh, us and a Russian leader, it's proved not to work. And I would submit that over the, over the years, not just of this last administration, but in part in the Clinton administration as well, uh, it was clearly demonstrated as insufficient to have just the relationship between two presidents. It didn't produce results. Now, you know, uh, there are all kinds of reasons for that, but I, I guess the best answer I can give to you is that uh, good working relations are necessary but not sufficient. Fair enough. Uh, the role of China, Mr. Ambassador, uh, being the third, I guess, in line, uh, uh, does it feel unwanted because we are having so much contact with the Russians? Or is well, the relationship think, uh, at a different level altogether? The one thing I don't think the Chinese probably have as a big problem is self-confidence. Um, <laughs> I, I have uh, long had great respect for their, their, their degree of, I would say, self-confidence and capacity to, to function internationally in support of their own goals. Uh, I mean, I think the relationship between our own country and China is quite extraordinary at this point. And if you look at it in sort of any objective markers other than perhaps nuclear weapons, it is far more profound and deep than it is between us and the Russians. I mean, the economic relationship is just not comparable. Sure. Um, and the, the role of China as an emerging major power um, is, you know, I think, simply the fact of life that we, we all are managing uh, in one way or another over the coming century. Um, our, and with, with Russia, I mean, you know, one of their facts of life is that they have China to the south border of two-thirds of their geographic territory in which they have a total of 17 million people. So nobody lives. In, in Siberia and Russia's Far East, basically. Um, yet it's the longest border Russia has. 
is with China. And so managing the China-Russia relationship from the Moscow perspective is of critical importance. Um, I think we have not come to the point yet where we are discussing with the Russians or, or others Asia policy terribly much. We do uh, North Korea nuclear being an exception. Right. But generally we have not uh, spent a great deal of time on it. And I think uh, at the same time that for the Russian side, um, the Asian dimension is going to grow steadily in importance. It's already much bigger than the importance they attach to it in terms of the time they devote to it. But it, it is going to be a major issue. Um, and I, you know, I think in that sense uh, the need for Russia to maintain good relations with China has grown steadily since the mid-80s. And I think it's one point of continuity. If you, if you watch Russian policy, it has steadily worked to try to develop a, uh, I would say, a steady relationship with China which is not going to produce tensions because they have no answer to tensions. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Um, we will open the forum for a Q&A session just a moment. Before I came here, I got an email uh, from my daughter. She couldn't be here. Uh, she wanted to attend. And to use my moderator's prerogative, if you don't mind, I will ask this question of hers and then we'll open the forum for Q&A session, as I said. What can the United States and the world learn from the former Soviet Union's 10-year war in Afghanistan in light of America's involvement in Afghanistan today? <laughs> Well, I don't know that I'm going to have the answer to Mr. Obama's di dilemma at the moment. Um, what I do think uh, one might say is it probably not only the Soviet involvement in Afghanistan, but many other foreign powers involvement in Afghanistan over several centuries. Um, I suppose the one thing one might take away from it is that um, a military imposed political solution is not likely to work. Um, now the dynamics are quite different. I mean, uh, I, we do not have um, Soviet Union on one side supporting one group and the United States on the other supporting the other group. I mean, it's a different set of issues in some ways. but. Uh, the reality is that a, com a country like Afghanistan is a terribly complex, uh, difficult environment in which to, um, I would say, the, the Russians found in which to operate as something like a, a normal European state with an army. Uh, it just has never worked that way and it's probably not going to now. Uh, so that, to me, I think the critical question before us, and I will say this straight out, is I don't understand the mission <laughs> that we have, whether it's us or NATO or Mr. Karzai. Or, I mean, it is not clear, right. and I don't think it's clear to the American people. And I would say for the, for the Soviet case, it kept changing and it wasn't clear to them either. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps the one thing we ought to be thinking very carefully about, and here I sympathize very much with, with my military friends, you know, they need to understand what the job is. What's the mission? What are we after? Right. Then they can plan. But if left with an unclear mission or an something that's not defined clearly, um, they have no basis on which to make those decisions. And that becomes very, very difficult. Now, you know, I have my own views, which I just soon not <laughs> discuss about what You're the mission ought to, well, I think <laughs> I won't, but, but uh, what the mission ought to be. But I would submit that in reading the papers and in listening to the people talking about our Afghan dilemmas and decisions and so forth, the one thing I think the American people deserve and have not had is a clear, you know, one or two sentence statement of just what it is we're Absolutely. trying to do. That's why there's so much eroding. Uh, of well, I, I, I fear that's right. And I think um, in that sense, uh, as the Soviets had mission creep and change and so forth and not successfully, it seems to me we are facing the same danger. 
and that we need to have ourselves and our allies and probably the neighboring states all agree on, on what the minimum requirements are going to be that we're after in Afghanistan. And I guess of that, I'd kind of leave it. Oh, good. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of questioners here. Anne is uh, uh, number one here. Uh, Anne, please get up, introduce yourself, your affiliation, and ask a brief, concise question, if you don't mind. Okay, I'll try. My name is Anne yeah. Is that on? No. Yeah. And I'm a stay-at-home mom who watches the news all the time. So um, my question is, how do you deal with Russia, the history being that they were the Soviet Union, and after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they had their deal with uh, democracy or a uh, changing government, and now they have gone back, I see them backstepping, going more towards the secretive, um, hard to deal with, you don't know what they're doing, and your point about verification, how do you deal with that secretive element and the fact that they're ruthless. I mean, in Afghanistan, they were known for just mowing down the citizens with their helicopters. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, I, I think one, uh, first of all, there are a couple of things about, about Russia today which are interesting facts that people really have to bear in mind, it seems to me, in dealing with them. And some of the background of why some of the things go on that go on or how they are. I mean, first of all, th this nation, Russia, is no less a new state than all the other neighbors, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and so forth. Russia never lived within these borders in its history. And so it has uh, always uh, been an empire, and suddenly it's a new nation state with borders and boundaries and so forth. So the, the fundamental reality here is this is a state that's trying to define itself and figure out what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. It, it, it is not a given. This is not the Soviet Union in drag, as I used to <laughs> say. You know, it, it is something very different. Um, it is not the same kind of multinational empire that it used to be, in which uh, the Russian population was actually at most half. Is now Russian population now about 80 percent of the Russian Federation. The, the other 20 percent are mixed nationalities, including I would say, well, people think somewhere between 10 and 15. 18 percent Muslim. But it is not the same kind of empire that it used to be. So defining themselves as a new nation state is a very difficult business. And they carry a huge amount of baggage in doing so. Uh, from the Soviet period, from the period even before that. Um, and, uh, you know, if they are 15, 20 years into this process. Um, the only thing I would say is that we, as we approach 20 years of post-Soviet reality in that part of the world, I mean, two things are true. We, we do not start today from the same place we were 20 years ago when the Soviet Union broke up. 20 years of history has established a new order in Eurasia, in Russia, and so on. It may not be what we had hoped. It may be more than we'd hoped. I mean, but whatever, however you view it, but it is different from, from what it was. Secondly, Russia is today integrated into the international systems, economic, political, security, and so on, in ways that the Soviet Union never was. The Soviet Union was determined to have its own system and to set up an alternative to what I would call the, you know, what is more or less prevailed as market economics and, uh, you know, nation states in the way we have it. So they are interdependent with us, Europe, Asia, the rest of the world in ways that they are finding very difficult to get used to. Uh, the lesson of the financial crisis of 1998, the previous one for the Russians, was a very hard one because it was the first time in a century that they found out they could not separate their economic reality from the rest of the world. And they didn't have control anymore. That was a terrible realization for, for leaders who had more or less been able to control an empire's economic system with not much re you know, relevance to the rest of the world. Well, 
what I'm suggesting here is you deal with this government as a government in transition that is still finding its way. It has many unattractive characteristics from the past, uh, you know, secretiveness. On the other hand, freedom of speech, press, and so forth are nowhere near as subject to repression as they were in the Soviet period, and I can tell you that from real experience. I mean, it, it is a country that is developing and is going to have to make its own decisions. Now, I think what we can do always is to try to stand for the right things, try to encourage the right trends, and try to discourage the wrong ones. But the idea that we will make these decisions for Russia or will remake Russia in somebody's image is just not going to happen. I mean, the world is a very diverse place and we're going to have to live with all of the various forms of it. What we can insist on is that Russia conduct its business as an international major power within the sort of basic norms of acceptable behavior. And in that sense, I mean, you know, invading your neighbors or this kind of thing really is beyond what you can accept. That's but I, you know, I think that's kind of, uh, that's sort of where we are today. Um, I think you deal with them as a state uh, that is a major power with a big economy and one who is important to us. And you try to encourage the better instincts and you try to make the arrangements you need when things of our interests are really at stake. 